This week on Merchants of Change, we've got Pat D'Amico. Pat served in the United States Army for eight years before transitioning to sales with Johnson & Johnson. He transitioned into sales training and development where he spent 20 plus years training and recruiting salespeople in the medical device space before starting his own consulting business about face development that does leadership development at all levels, including individual executive coaching, executive level selling skills, and advanced negotiations. Here he is, Pat D'Amico. I'm J.R. Bunkle, co-founder and CEO of The Shift Group, and you're listening to Merchants of Change. This is a podcast about transferring the skills and behaviors we acquire as athletes and military veterans into becoming a professional salesperson. Each week, we'll introduce you to a top performer who will help us understand how they became professional merchants of change. What's up, kid? Today on the show, we got Pat D'Amico. Pat, great to meet you, man. JR, good to see you, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, just for any new listeners that are tuned in this weekend and for context for you, Pat, um, we started our show shortly after we started our company with the idea being that we wanted to be able to create content for our candidates and, and the folks that go through our training program, which are all uh, former athletes and, and military veterans that are considering a transition into sales. Our audience has slowly grown over time to include people that are new to sales, and we have a really big piece of our audience that are sales leaders. So the goal of the show is to talk a little bit um, to, to our guests who are all former usually military veterans or athletes that have found success in the go-to-market function, right? Um, so sharing a little bit about your own experience, serving, uh, talking a little bit about your own transition, and then we kind of finalize and, and end the show around leaving some nuggets for our audience that's going to help make them either their transition better um, or their, you know, if they're already in roles, uh, some nuggets for them to continue to be successful. So sound like a good plan. We're going to start awesome. with, your, with your service. I love Works it. Works for me, man. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. awesome. So I um, was looking through the notes, uh, Pat, and I saw that you enlisted at 17 years old. So we, we typically start with like a pretty broad stroke question. If I ask you to think about some of your favorite memories from your military service, what are some of the things that pop into your head? Oh, wow. So, uh, oh, there's so many. Um, yeah, I guess for me, you know, going to basic training at 17, I mean, I was, I was young. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. It was my second plane flight, right? I, I arrived at, it, I arrived at basic training late in the evening after everyone else had, had already processed in and gone to bed. So somebody led me to this, uh, to this, uh, you know, I was at Fort Knox actually, where I went to basic training, led me to the barracks and I found a bunk. Everybody was, was asleep and I went to bed and at, you know, four o'clock in the morning, the drill sergeant started banging the, uh, the old school garbage can with the lid screaming and yelling. And, and that was, that was quite a shock, shocking moment. And of course, cause I was late, I was on a top bunk. So you know how that is, right? You're jumping off the top bunk. Your, your body's not even awake. You're wondering if your legs are going to give out. So, so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's my first, actually it's my first military memory now that I'm thinking of it. <laughs> But I had a, I had an interesting career. You know, I I I, uh, I ended up going to Valley Forge Military Academy on an Army scholarship, and uh, very grateful for that. But I, I often say that the, the military probably got a lot more out of me than I got out of them because uh, it was the late '80s. So uh, I deployed to Panama immediately after the invasion. That was a really interesting assignment, trying to get the Panamanian police force up and working. Um, and then I went to Saudi Arabia and Iraq for Desert Shield, Desert Storm. And then did also, uh, I did a, a deployment to Cuba, which is uh, to Guantanamo Bay, which is not a usual site. Wow. That was a really interesting time uh, to be in Guantanamo. Not not the worst duty. It's a Caribbean island, so you know, it's not terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we weather-wise, for sure. But definitely, yeah. you know, a lot, of tension, a lot of tension back then. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Now, um, when, uh, how long did you serve for, Pat? So I was in a total of eight years. I did, uh, while well, I was at Valley Forge, I did a couple of years in the Guard. Then I uh, ended up finishing my degree in D.C. I was a platoon leader 
with the DC National Guard for two years and then went on active duty for four after that. So I, I had total total years of service was about eight before, but on active active service. Well, th- well, thank you for your service. Now the big the big question I have for you was there a plan? Like you know, you did eight years in like year six through eight. I, were you thinking about like what am I going to do next? Obviously, you had the the fortunate experience of also getting an education, which I think is really important. But like, was there a plan for for when you um, when you left active duty? Well, the, the plan was to get a job, Jar. That was that was sort of the plan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as much as I could say. So I was I was at my advanced course. I had finished my last deployment. Uh, and my assignment, and I went to my advanced course at Fort McClellan, Alabama, and it was at that point I, you know, had had planned to transition right after the advanced course. So at that time, it was, and, and probably still is, it was really popular for junior military officers to work with these recruiting agencies. So I ended up getting hooked up with a couple, and the result of that was you went to a conference where there were a bunch of employers there, and you got to interview with different companies. So I had narrowed it down, or I should say been narrowed down based on the companies there to Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer and ended up taking a job as a sales rep with J and J in a town called Jackson, Tennessee. So for anybody who knows where Memphis and Nashville is, imagine taking that three hour drive and stopping for gas midway through. That's essentially Jackson, small town, and at the time I thought, shoot, you know, I've been, I've lived in a handful of small towns in the military, right? I mean, you know, what, what, what you don't realize till you leave is when you live in a small military town, it's a very different field than when you are somebody who grew up in the North and you are now moving to a town of like Jackson, Tennessee in the South and you are not from there. And to make it worse, you're from New York. I mean, I, I grew up in Buffalo, which is not New York City, but, you know, they don't make it distinct yeah. from there. So, uh so uh, not, you know, not my, my greatest professional experience. It was a good, you know, good role that got me into the industry, but uh, I was kind of in a hurry to get out of there, if I'm, if I'm being, being fair. Uh, yeah, that's fair for sure. Now, did you have like, did you have like feelings about like what it meant to be in sales before you took that job? Most people have that kind of vision in their head of like a used car salesman. Was that where your head was at? I had very little vision of that because, you know, my father was a construction worker and most of my most of my immediate and extended family were primarily laborers, you know, other than the lucky, you know, uncle I had who was a doc, you know, who's a physician. So I had I had no real idea of what I was getting into. I just knew that a lot of people that were leaving the military were really trying to get these jobs. So there must have been something good about it. Right. So uh, so I I did not have any preconceived notions as to what it was going to entail. I love it. I love it. Now, I know you started in sales, but you've spent most of your career in like learning and development and, and like sales enablement, right? How did, how did that, how did the transition go from being a salesperson into that part of the go-to-market function? Yeah. So I've had a pretty fortunate and really varied and interesting career. Uh, typically, especially at that time, when you were starting in sales in the in the life sciences, whether it's medical device or pharmaceutical, there were normally two tracks, right? There was usually there was there was sales and marketing, and there was also training. So a lot of folks back then would sort of go from one to the other, right? You might do a sales job, then then do a sales training job, then go back to sales, maybe then do a marketing stint, go back to sales. That was more common. My path was pretty different. I was I went through the leadership development program at J and J during my, well, I was a sales rep. And so what happened was uh, at the time, you, you were pretty open to be, be able to go anywhere. If you, you had to be blindly relocatable. It's a whole nother discussion, JR, about how we as an industry kind of abused our people back then. And I remember someone saying to me, look, here's the deal. Now that you're done with the program, they're gonna come to you and offer you a location. And if you say no, you better really hate it because you can't say no to your second offer. So if the first wow. offer seems just kind of bad, you might want to say yes, because the second one might be worse, right? That was really the way it was treated back then. But what was ironic was my my boss's boss came to me and said, hey, now you're done. Um, you're going to end up in Birmingham, Nashville, Memphis, or was Birmingham, Nashville, Memphis, or Atlanta. And I said, hey, I, you know, I'd really like to get back into the Northeast, you know, closer to, you know, 
my family and friends? And uh, the answer was, no, you're going to be here. So at that point, I started looking for other options and got connected with the guy up uh, in New Jersey at J&J who reached out out of nowhere one day and said, hey, I got your name. Understand you're looking into the Northeast. I've looked at your background. And he said, we've been given, he, he had been given, he said, money to start the sales, a consolidated sales recruiting department at J&J. And so he said to me, look, I've got money for six months. If it's six months, it works. Then it becomes a permanent department. And, you know, we just run it that way. He said, but if it doesn't work, at least I'm going to move you up here for the role. So you'll be here. We'll find you a manager job. So that's what I did. And he and I started the sales recruiting department for J and J. I did that for a few years Then he moved on. I took over the department, which had grown obviously to national. This was for the continental U S and then, uh, and then while I was running that recruiting department, the, uh, my boss came to me of the, the head of recruiting came to me and said, Hey, look, we're also shifting how we do recruiting back then a recruiter handled sourcing candidates and presenting candidates. They said, look, we want to separate that out. So we now need a sourcing department for all functions. Would you be willing uh, to start that? So along with the sale running sales recruiting, I also started that department. So from there, what was great about that job, JR, for me, and was really rare at, at such low tenure at J&J, was I got a chance to work with every organization in J&J. So I created relationships. And when it came time for me to want to move on, I was sort of able to pick and choose where I wanted to go. So I, you know, had, you know we, we had just acquired a company in a really exciting business in the medical device sector. So I sort of, you know, went to the president of, uh, or actually the VP of sales and marketing at the time and said, hey, look, I'm really looking for an opportunity. I'd love to come to the organization. And lo and behold, he said, well, good timing. Um, we need to create a sales operations department. And so how do you feel about creating another department? And so I took that role on, did that for a few years, uh, then took a sales manager job in New York City for a number of years. Uh, and then from there, took a marketing job. And then I went into training. So I've, uh, I've been really fortunate that what's really unique is of all the roles I've had in my career, over half of them were brand new. They were departments that didn't exist. I, I started to get this reputation of, hey, if you're looking to start a department within J&J, &J, which is difficult, we've got this guy that sort of knows how to do it. So, uh, so I did that a number of times over my 15 years at J&J. &J, uh, and then I left J&J &J to go to a startup as a VP of commercial operations for a startup medical device company in the U.S. And after two years, at that point, we were purchased by Medtronic, which was the largest medical device company in the world. Correct. And um, and that's really, JR, at that point where I shifted my focus to learning and development, my my passion around teaching, my experience that I had built over time, and then really my 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 biggest passion of leadership and management development, I was able to begin really focusing on when I started running large learning and development organizations. That's amazing. And that that obviously that you know experience in learning development has led you into your new, I say new, but you know, you've been doing it for six, seven years around um, about face development. I, I want to talk a little bit about, about face development. What is your guys' focus there now? Yeah. So, um, so important to mention my transition from Medtronic, what, what I knew was going to happen eventually. I live in the Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania area, about an hour west of New York. And I had been working remotely based in Minneapolis for Medtronic, which had been yep. fine because I traveled for the most part for my job. But after about five years or so, they came to me and said, hey, look, it's, it's time for you to get promoted and, and you got to move to Minneapolis. And nothing against Minneapolis, but <laughs> uh, you know, I always say it just wasn't the right time. I, I don't know if there would have been a right time. I grew up in Buffalo, New York, so I've done my time in, in the cold. <laughs> and, you know. So... Uh, <laughs> So I had a decision to make. Did I want to milk the job I had been in? Frankly, I was was five years in. I was ready to move on. And then I started asking myself, do I want to go do the same job again, running a big learning and development organization at another company, which really was more of the same. And I, I had really two things happen at that time in my life. I turned 50. It's kind of a you know watershed moment. Uh, and then my father had passed away. So I was sort of like, you know what? I, I, I think I need a change. And so at that point, I was given an offer to do some work for Matrix Achievement Group, which is who I do, you know, large majority of my work with as a consultant for them. Uh, and so I uh, exited 
the, you know, exited that sector and went into consulting and started my own business. And so my focus, I would say I spend about probably 40% of my time facilitating program programs on selling, selling skills, advanced negotiations techniques, executive level selling. I, I do tend to work with a lot of experienced, uh, you know, long tenured sellers, uh, specifically and only in the medical device sector. And then probably about another 40% of my time I spend doing leadership and management development programs for, again, same sector, primarily uh, medical device sector. And then a smaller portion of my time, I do one-on-one -on -one executive coaching with uh, C-suite executives. I love it. I, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of peel back the onion a little bit, specifically on like some of your thoughts around training salespeople. Is that, mm -hmm. can we, can we dig on that a oh, little bit? Please, by all means, love to, love to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. I knew you would. I knew you would. I think we share the same passion. Um, now, I was reading through some of the notes about like your pillars for training entry-level salespeople. Um, the one thing that jumped out at me that there's two things that jumped out at me. The first one I want to jump into because I agree so much with you is this idea of like being careful about advanced training and focusing on the continuous development of the foundations. Can you talk about that a little bit, Pat? Yeah. yeah. So it's very common for an organization to come to me and say, Hey, look, our, our folks are experienced, right? We're looking for advanced sales training. And, and a lot of times I'll say, look, there, there is no such thing as advanced sales training. There is a reconfirmation and a growth of the basics of selling skills. It's, you know, it's always those basic selling skills that you are advancing and you're applying them in different areas. So when I think of advanced selling, what I really look and say is, hey, look, you're looking to enhance the basic selling skills of your folks because they're calling on either a different customer or in my case, as a lot of it is, they're calling on a different level, right? How do you take basic selling skills that you know that you've been using for years and how do you tweak them so that you can be impactful in front of a C-suite executive, right? Which is a very different customer base uh, or very different customer to talk to than say an end user in, in, in the spaces that I work in in medical device. So uh, the basics are so important. You know, one of my best friends is uh, is a major league baseball uh, strength guy, and we have this discussion all the time. And he he always says the same thing. He's like, you know, it is it is always about the basics and continuing to strengthen the basic selling skills that you have. Yes, a hundred percent. It's it's um, it's the fundamentals done well over and over again. Yes, it's going to change. Like the details are going to change depending on your audience, depending on the price of your solution and how they have to buy it. That's where the advanced piece comes in. But it's like, I, I'm a hockey player, Pat. So I, you know, we think about, I think about playing hockey is all about like winning little one-on-one -on -one battles through all over the ice. Right. And that's kind of what, what we're talking about here is like sales, sales, as a whole is like this big strategic vision, but ultimately it comes down to this, like these little hand-to-hand -hand combat situations where you just have to execute the fundamentals well over and over again, right? Absolutely. I love that. That is amazing. Now, the other thing I wanted to pull pull the string on was on, you know, I think we, we should both share a passion on the science behind selling and the science behind change, right? I, I'm sure, you you probably recognize the 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 title of our podcast is called Merchants of Change, mm -hmm. and we chose that uh, title because one of my mentors early on, one of the sales leaders I worked for, had a big sign behind his desk that said Merchants of Change, and I asked him about it one day, and he's like, "Well, that's what that's what you are, Jr. Like when you're a salesperson, you're basically convincing somebody to take an action." that's going to change how they're doing something today, right? Whatever it is, and it really doesn't matter what product you're selling. That's really what you're selling is this idea of change. So, so talk to me a little bit about like, how has that been instituted in, in the programs that you're running at your current company and some of the programs you did at companies like Medtronic? So the, great topic to talk about change. First and foremost, couldn't agree with you more, right? No matter where you are, with your customer, no matter where your existing business is with your customer. As a salesperson, 
your ultimate goal is you are trying to get them to change something, right? If you're not the incumbent, and you're trying to get in there and unseat somebody, you're trying to get them to change. If you are the incumbent, you're usually trying to what? Grow your business more. That's change as well. So no matter what you're doing when it comes to sales, you're always trying to get them to change something. And I think where, where it's gotten interesting as we now relate it to the science is I'm, I'm very much a student of history and, and I'm a master of a lot of useless information. But you know, the reality is that the sales training industry really didn't even start until the 80s, right? That was where we really started for the first time to see sales training be talked about and training courses be developed and the concept of a sales training process. And early on, a lot of that was focused in you know the late 80s and into the early 90s was focused on, on uh, the concept of selling to a need, which really is still the basis for most selling processes today, right? At the end of the day, you have to identify a customer need, right? What isn't working and how does your solution solve that problem? And that was the way things existed probably until I would say about 10 years ago. Um, from a sales training perspective, that was sort of really the base and, and needs-based selling was what everybody focused on. Around 10 years ago, the industry started getting exposure and looking at all the research that was being done in, in neuroscience around how and why human beings make decisions, right? So we knew about the change aspect, but we started seeing all the science around uh, around how human beings make decisions. It's a really interesting book, although it's a really rough read and I wouldn't recommend it. I'm just looking at it over on the shelf by Antonio Damasio called uh, Descartes' Error. He started really looking at some of this research and started teasing out how this sort of impacts this decision-making and started making some correlations that we started looking at and going, wait a minute, there's a direct connection here to selling, which is that, the way people make decisions and how we sell to that science piece of it, to their, to their reptilian brain, to their rational brain, their emotional brain, really has a lot of impact potentially in our field. And it was at that point that you know, we in our industry and largely the work that I do now and, and do again with my organization uh, about face development and matrix achievement group that I work with, a lot of it is around and based on this science uh, around the human brain, right? How and why do people make decisions? And how do you break patterns, which is a big thing, right? When, when you are going to see a customer, you need to understand that that customer subconsciously has an opinion of what's about to happen. You are a salesperson. You can't change that, right? So there's these things going through their mind, right? How long is this going to take? Are you going to waste my time? Do I trust you, right? These are all the things that subconsciously are happening. What we started realizing was, our ability to break those patterns is really critical in our ability to be successful as salespeople. So this, this whole concept of brain science is incredibly important when you are looking at sales today and how are you, how do you make yourself more impactful than your competition is really to, I think is, is now to understand the science of what's the impact you're having and how do you actually move that person that's across the table from you or that you're meeting with based on the science of how they make those decisions. I love that. I love that. If, if you were going to, I know there's a lot of meat on that bone, Pat. Yeah, or, <laughs> a couple days <laughs> worth. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say, we could probably make this a whole series. But I, I guess for our audience, right, pretty new to salespeople, um, what's, like, what's like one important nugget out of that science of decision-making that that you want to leave them with to think about that, that might make them think about their role as a, as a salesperson differently. I think one thing I would say is understand that the customer you're speaking to has personal reasons as to why they're going to make a decision. We tend to often to look at it as, well, here's what I'm selling. And the solution does this for the broader audience, but that's really the tip of the iceberg. How does solving that problem for that audience positively impact the person you're selling to, right? Something. And it could be something as easy as when, when somebody says something like, I need your solution to be durable. Why are, they, why are they wondering that? And the question to ask is, 
what happens when it's not durable? Yes. What are the downside impacts to that individual? Because they're saying, hey, this is important to me. But somewhere behind that is the reason it's important to them, not to the broader organization, to them. So if it's not durable, that might mean they get a lot of phone calls complaining. That might mean their staff is unhappy, right? All these downstream impacts that land on them. And that's the problem that you're actually trying to solve for that individual who's making the decision. And in that, also solving the larger problem that they're facing. I, I have to like, I have to call this out to our audience because this is such an important nugget that you just hit on, Pat, because, and I'm sure it, you've seen more change than I have. I've been selling since like the early 2000s. The biggest change I've seen, especially at larger organizations, is it used to be command and control. If you could get to the top person, you could typically, and, and you could find out what you're talking about, what's important to them, you know, as well as usually the higher you get, the more like we language they use instead of I language, right? Like yep. it's like, we need this. So some, you know, a good executive is thinking broadly about the organization and you could kind of have that broader organizational talk. Now in two 2024, organizations are flattening out and it's decision by consensus. So being able to understand all the players in a decision process and what they care about on a personal level is going to be, it's only going to become more and more critical. Organizations aren't going to move back more towards command and control. They're going to move more towards flatter decision-making processes. So what you just talked about, I'm so glad that's the nugget you chose to share. Yeah. And I'll give, I'll give you one more on that while we're talking about that, that command and control and, and decision by consensus. The other key is you've got to be speaking the same language to each of those individuals and those languages might be different. And that's something that we haven't done a good job or, or I should say, I don't see organizations do a good job of. Here's what all organizations that I work with, I can emphatically say do a great job of. They do a great job of training folks on the features and benefits of their solution, right? I know how it works. I know what it does. I know what the end user impact is. The challenge is, the higher you go in the organization, or now when you're going to folks that are outside of, let's say, the buying department that are more strategic in the way they think about it, you've got to be speaking a different language to them. You can't go to them and talk about the features and benefits. That's not what's important to them. They may be most focused on what's the return on this investment from a high level. That's a strategic discussion. So, you know, in our space, I work a lot in medical in in, in the medical device space. There are really three languages we speak. We speak clinical language, we speak financial language, and we speak strategic language. Clinical language is spoken at the end user level, physicians, healthcare providers. Financial language is spoken at the finance level that's usually purchasing, right? Which is the worst place and the worst language to have to speak because it's always the hardest. And then we have to be able to speak strategic language. And one of the biggest errors, one of the absolute biggest errors I see is folks go to the strategic level and they're speaking clinical language. Yes. And the reality is those executives won't see someone again who comes in and talks about features and benefits because those folks realize you need to spend money to make money, right? We're used to, you know, talking about nickel and dimes, right? Well, you know, I want to buck off or I want 10 points on this contract. At the strategic level, they want to know what's my investment return. And if you show me a return, I know that I have to make money. I have to spend money to make money. Yes. Yeah. There, there's two nuggets, I, one-liners that I've used my whole career. I heard from leaders along the way. Number one is you get relegated to who you sound like. So in the medical device world, if you're talking about the features and benefits of your specific device, guess who you're going to be talking to? The nurses and doctors that are instituting that, right? If you're talking uh, finance language, you're going to get sent to finance. You're talking strategic, you're going to get sent to the top on the decision makers. The, the second thing um, is that people, people make five figure purchases to solve six figure problems, six figure purchases to solve seven figure problems and seven figure purchases to solve eight figure problems. And the eight figure problems aren't being talked about in the med in the medical world. They're not being talked about in the operating room. No. They're being talked about in the boardroom. And then and the same thing applies to software and, you know, any, any solution that you're selling. So everything you just said really aligns with those two, those two one-liners for me. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. Um, 
you you made a comment uh, during the pre-show chat, Pat, about like feeling like the best way, the best and most effective way for sellers to learn is from pairs. Can you can can you uh, kind of extend that thought a little bit? Yeah, I'm really passionate about this, Jr. What I've learned over the years and observed in, in so many organizations is, you know, when we think about training, right? Training is a is a largely sometimes a point in time, and I'm also a big believer in you know training and learning has got to be a continuous process. But at the end of the day, it's only a small piece of folks development, right? When you go to a formal program, if you, you know, if you're, you're selling 52 weeks a year, you know, how many weeks a year do you actually attend a, an actual training event? Or how often do you participate in sort of, you know, product launches and things like that? Uh, and here's the truth. Most folks want to hear from their successful peers. So if, if you and I are peers today, JR, if, if, if I'm, if I'm a, you know, uh, if you and I are peers on a team today and tomorrow I become the manager of that team, you and the rest of the team are going to quietly go, oh, Pat doesn't know what it's like out here. He has no idea, even though it's only been a day, right? It's just our, that's just the way we are. It's just our natural sort of state. So I'm a big believer in, in order to understand and grow my own skills, I want to hear from folks doing the same role what's working and just as importantly if arguably not you know more important is what's not working right we learn far more from our failures than we do from our successes so why do we why do i need to reinvent the wheel so when i'm working with organizations i am constantly pushing you know first asking how often does the team get together on calls how often do you share successes how often do you share failures and i really try to encourage them and work with them to create a a process that this becomes a regular occurrence, whether it's synchronous, where they, you know, some teams, some executive selling teams I work with, they do get on the phone or on a Zoom once a week. Others, you know, will send information out in short video, but whatever they're comfortable doing, I'm always really encouraging because, you know, if I hear, if, if I see JR, you know, send a video out of a meeting they had with a customer, I might evaluate that video and say, you know, I, I like that. JR's approach is a little different than mine. So I'm not comfortable with the whole thing, but pieces of it. But then I might see a couple other ones and I might take bits and pieces of those as well. Now I've sort of created my own that I'm comfortable with because there's so much about selling that is you've got to be comfortable with what you're doing and you've got to find your own way to do it, right? Because that's what's going to make it most impactful to the customer. Uh, so I'm a huge, just a huge believer. Peer-to-peer -peer sharing, I think is is still the to me is the greatest way to develop your skills to see others that are doing well and see the mistakes they're making totally i i mean i always tell people the be the best thing that happened to me in the beginning of my career was being surrounded by five mentors and i always used to say i'm the smartest parrot in the room i would steal for, i would steal from each of them i would see what what they did that was like would very would be very inauthentic for me to do and i wouldn't use that or I would take it and I would, I would, I would tweak it for like, how would he, he does this really well, or she does this really well, but the way she delivers it isn't very JR ish. Right. So I'm, I'm going to take that. I'm going to make it my own, but I am going to take it from her. And, and, and I think you answered the next question I was going to ask, which is like, we work with a lot of earlier stage companies. They don't have the learning and development budget that their, their larger peers do. The onboarding isn't as structured, but there's no excuse why they can't make peer-to-peer -peer learning part of their operating rhythm, which is exactly what they should be doing at smaller organizations. And if you go into a smaller organization, make be a forcing function, like make it happen, right? Yeah, new organizations, it's absolutely key because in established organizations that have been around, you hire folks you've got some good idea of what's working out there and what isn't working out there. Trial and error has been occurring for years. When you have a new organization with a new solution or it's a startup, right, that sharing amongst each other is absolutely critical. I mean, and it's got to happen at times, depending on the size of your almost daily, right? Well, I went out and I had this meeting with a customer. I tried this out. That didn't work at all. You know, this was their reaction to that. They posed a question to me that I was completely unprepared for. So don't ask that question in that manner, right? Now I've thought about it, I might ask it this way. So the more sharing that can be done, and, and I do find that a lot of new organizations are getting better at that, right? They understand, hey, 
we're just starting this out and we've got to talk about what's working out there and what isn't. So it's, it's absolutely critical for, for new organizations and startups. I love it. I love it. Um, Pat, we have a, we have a final question. We ask every guest, but before I do, I'm, I'm, I'm curious as a, as a fellow entrepreneur, how'd you come up with about face development? Like what's the story behind that name? Yeah. So I'm glad you asked. I don't remember if this was on the questionnaire. Um, uh, I, are you familiar with the book about face develop about face by David Hackworth? I am not. Okay. So, um, forgive me for, uh, so in 19, in the late eighties, um, this book came out about face by David Hackworth, David Hackworth and Hackworth. Yeah, that's, uh, a big, a, that's a big book right there, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> Hack was a legend. And at the time Hack retired, he was considered the most highly decorated army officer at the time. A uh, little bit of a controversial history. He was, um, he was a soldier soldier. He yep. did not believe in the approach we were taking to Vietnam. He went public with that. It, you know, definitely damaged him. He obviously never, never made general, but it was such a moving book, not only to me, but my peers at the time. And we were all just addicted to it. So I, I wrote a letter to David Hackworth and I said, just want to let you know how much this book meant to me. And, uh, and he wrote me back. And so, uh, I, it started this 20 year friendship with, you know, it's like, you know, they say sometimes it's not good to meet your heroes. Don't agree with that. Right. So David used to write, uh, it was found it interesting because David would send, he would send postcards. He, he used to communicate in postcards. So I have a handful of them. Um, and so uh, he always meant a lot to me. Um, next to my father passing, probably the person that passed it was the most impactful. And uh, he's buried in Arlington. But what's also interesting about, uh, about Hack is that um, uh, he had moved out of the US. He lived in Australia for a while. And then ended up coming back to the U.S. So, you know, when I could, I, I would get back, I would, you know, get together with him. But he, he had a huge impact on my life. And so when it came time for me to start my own company, it, it just fit so perfectly, right? Here was this mentor that I got to know personally, my hero that I became friends with. And, um, and it just fit because about face is really the definition of about face is a change in direction. And ultimately, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, with my clients is, is change, you know, change some sort of direction. So, yeah, it's a really impactful book. They actually, the most recent, the most recent edition, um, the Ford is by Jacko Willing. So amazing. That is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, extreme ownership is one of my favorite books. So yeah, Jocko, it's a great book. Jocko's gives that, that that's, that's a huge uh, shout out. Yeah. Um, and I'm reading this, this quote by general Creighton Abrams about um, David Hackworth. The, mo the best battalion commander I ever saw in the United States Army. That's high praise, man. Yeah, awesome. yeah. Pretty incredible guy. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that, Pat. No, I thanks for asking. There, 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 there's no accident why a lot of companies get their name. Sometimes it's a PR company comes in and tells you. Uh, but I think for guys like me and you that start our own companies, that it means a lot. So I'm, I'm glad yeah, I got it. Was intensely, it's intensely, per intensely personal for me. Absolutely. I love it. I like it a lot. Um, all right. So last question, um, Pat, what we like to talk about in our program is, you know, when you're a soldier and when you're a, like an elite athlete, you're, you're, you're pretty dialed in, right? Like, you know, you have a purpose, you have passion to become excellent at things. You're practicing things, you're pursuing goals, you're performing on a day-to-day -day basis. What happens in the transition and it happened to me, um, it happens to a lot of the, you lose that, you lose a lot of that purpose and that passion. Um, and part of our program is, yeah, we teach kids how to write a cold email or make a cold call. But I think the most important thing we do is getting them dialed in again as salespeople. So what we like to ask every guest is what does it mean to be dialed in as a salesperson to you? So I think for me, it comes back to what I would consider the definition of a professional. And for me, the definition of a professional is somebody who's always working on their game. Somebody who's always trying to get better. And I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm, you know, just the king of useless pieces of information, you know, in the United States, according to the U S Bureau of Labor Statistics, only 30% of jobs in the U S require what they would say was a professional certification. So we think of doctors, lawyers, 
teachers, plumbers, right? But it begs the question, if, if only 30% of jobs require a professional certification that are certified as professional, then how do the rest of us, how do the other 70% of us define being a professional? And that is always working on your game. And so my thought is in anything you're doing, you have to make it your profession. You have to become a student of that profession. And there's, there's no finish line, right? This is the same way with leadership. When I'm working with organizations, I'm talking about training leaders. You know, leadership development is a continuous and never ending journey. Your profession and your, your, your pursuit of excellence in your profession is a never ending journey. There's always more to learn. And as long as you always stay focused on that, you'll always be able to appreciate that you are a professional and that what you're doing makes a difference and matters. What you do matters, baby. Love it. Pat, awesome conversation, man. This is gonna be gold for our audience. Thank you so much for giving us your time, man. Jair, thank you for having me then. This was awesome. Thank you. This wraps up this episode of Merchants of Change. If you enjoyed this episode, the most meaningful way to say thanks is to submit a review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're interested in working with us, please come find us at www.shiftgroup.io.